There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. On March 2nd, 2017, former President George W. Bush appeared on The Ellen DeGeneres Show, hosted by the eponymous comedian. Bush laughed at himself and his inability to properly wear a poncho two months prior at the inauguration of President Donald Trump. Bush's aw shucks humility and TV dad persona seemingly clashed with the vulgar, mean-spirited bravado and rhetoric of the man at the center of said inauguration. For years, Bush had largely remained out of the public spotlight. For a time, the most notable aspect of his ex-presidency had been his life as an artist. His disastrous administration, long thought to be one of the worst in the history of the United States, precipitated this isolation. Even when future presidential hopeful Jeb Bush spoke of George during the Republican National Convention, he could only reference the catastrophic presidency in patronizing terms. My grandfather and my father have been incredible role models for me and served our country honorably. And my brother, well, I love my brother. Bush's administration presided over some of the worst disasters and lapses in judgment in history. But as years went on, two presidents later, Bush being kept out of the spotlight to paint and do little else, gave the nation a kind of collective amnesia. Maybe with how fast everything moves today and with news cycles that only last hours, holding on to the anger or even the memory of an election almost 20 years ago became too much for some people. But more than that, more than the natural flow of time and new dangers replacing old ones, there has been an unmistakable media campaign to rehabilitate the image of George W. Bush. He has been seen cavorting with Barack and Michelle Obama on friendly terms with the Clintons and is now a certified friend of a popular clean comedian and reigning queen of daytime network television. Her recent play date with Bush caused a bit of a stir, prompting criticism of this rehabilitation and DeGeneres' role in it. Put a pin in that, it'll come back around later. The attempt at rehabilitating both the image and presidency of George W. Bush has a lot of consequences, even as we are now two presidents removed from his administration. First, if we rehabilitate Bush, then the electorate can continue under the delusion that there are no systemic problems that have led us to where we are today. The only bad thing is the bad man currently in the White House, and once he's gone, everything will be back to normal, and normal is good. Donald Trump is easily one of the worst presidents of all time, but he doesn't have as much blood on his hands as Bush. So far. See, George W. Bush was better at being president than Trump, in the sense that Bush spoke like a human being and not like an angry, thin-skinned monster. Bush went through the rituals and mock public shaming and such that the president is expected to perform. President Trump, in terms of personality, is not presidential, but that alone doesn't make him automatically worse than Bush. History will have to take a wait-and-see approach following Trump's tenure as president. Second, when white liberals talk up George W. Bush as a glowing alternative to Trump, they normalize what he did. They normalize the wars, the civilian deaths, the poor response to Hurricane Katrina, the anti-LGBT legislation, and so much more. If Bush is normal and is rehabilitated in the era of Trump, Republicans can wash their hands of Trump once he's gone and push the false narrative that Bush is a real Republican, whereas Trump was an imposter. Another problem with rehabilitating the image and administration of George W. Bush is that it grants the Republicans another major figure to help the party. Remember, Bush has been mostly out of the spotlight until fairly recently. He campaigned a bit for his brother's doomed presidential bid, an act that many speculated could hurt more than help. But with the resurrected Bush, the Republicans could now have a living, breathing Republican standard to endorse and help future Republican candidates. All the other former living presidents are Democrats. The Republican Party has not been able to utilize either Bush as an individual or even reference the Bush presidency as a positive. If he's rehabilitated, they can then use the memory of the Bush administration to strengthen their party. Before, the Bush administration was a black mark on their history, even among some conservatives. If the Bush administration is seen in a new light, the black mark goes away, and the administration can then be used as evidence of the goodness of the Republican Party. 
Such a rehabilitation and rewriting of history would strengthen whichever Republican is nominated for the presidency after Trump. The country doesn't have to look back, reflect, and learn from past mistakes if those mistakes are whitewashed and its perpetrators rehabilitated into harmless old grandpas who simply have differences in political opinion with their friends. Reframing the disgust with the George W. Bush administration as a difference of opinion is not only a transparent attempt at rewriting history and rehabilitation, but also extremely insulting to the victims of said administration. This is more than having friends and family who registered to vote under a different party. That's just life. This is different. This has consequences. Your friend who votes differently than yourself is probably not a war criminal. Bush is. So, let's talk about that. Following the attacks of September 11th, 2001, the Bush administration demanded the Taliban in Afghanistan turn over Osama bin Laden, who was believed at the time to be hiding somewhere in Afghanistan. After some international back and forth over the legality of threatening war over a matter of mere extradition, the administration asked Congress to pass the Authorization for Use of Military Force Against Terrorists, a resolution that allowed the U.S. military to attack Afghanistan. Authorization to go to war, however, is not authorization to commit war crimes, at least not officially. Nevertheless, the amount of war crimes committed under the direct authorization of, or indirect actions of, the George W. Bush administration is staggering, even by the standards set by previous presidents. Vice President Dick Cheney, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and others in the Bush administration believed that international law placed unrealistic restrictions on the need for the United States to defend itself. On September 11, 2001, Bush is quoted by former head of the National Security Counterterrorism Group Richard Clark as saying, I don't care what the international lawyers say, we are going to kick some ass. In this case, kicking ass meant bombing civilian cities. At this juncture, the Bush administration committed itself to war crimes. On January 25, 2002, as prisoners were being sent from Afghanistan to Guantanamo, counsel to the president, Alberto Gonzalez, issued a memorandum agreeing with Justice Department officials that the Geneva Conventions, which were signed in good faith, were now quaint and outmoded and could be ignored by the United States. In the opinion of Jack Goldsmith, who later headed the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, the January 25th memo constituted a conspiracy to commit a war crime. Chiefest among Bush's war crimes were the intentional targeting of civilians during war, authorization of torture, and allowance of prisoner abuse, such as in the cases of Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay. The specifics are grisly. As it relates to torture, in 2002, Donald Rumsfeld approved new rules to allow some forms of torture to be used against prisoners. They didn't call it torture, but it obviously was. This includes waterboarding, which could result in hypothermia, forced stress positions, and more. However, what was allowed in theory was expanded in practice. In 2004, images from the Abu Ghraib prison proved the U.S. military was engaging in both physical torture and, in some cases, sexual abuse. Congress, in response to the Abu Ghraib scandal, passed the Detained Treatment Act of 2005, banning torture by the military, but not the CIA. However, Bush's signing statement indicated that he might authorize a violation of the law whenever he wanted. In terms of bombings, the numbers are massive, and in terms of civilians killed, the numbers are terrifying. All estimates of Iraq war casualties are disputed for various political reasons, but even the low estimate at 200,000 people is an incredible loss of life. That is more than 70 9-11s. High estimates reach somewhere around 600,000 people, which is well over 200 9-11s. The George W. Bush administration caused a death toll of the equivalent of over 200 times the amount of Americans we lost on 9-11, in one country alone. This is particularly tragic when said country had nothing to do with 9-11. Among other countries, the death toll grows higher. I've discussed this at length in a previous video, but this bears repeating or at least summarizing. Contrary to popular belief that civilian casualties are marginal and unintended, Brown University's Cost of War project has proven that civilian casualties in the War on Terror outnumber military casualties. More civilians die in war than the people who either choose to fight or are conscripted to fight. 
In addition to those killed by direct acts of violence, the number of indirect deaths, those resulting from disease, displacement, and loss of critical infrastructure, is believed to be several times higher, running well into the millions. The Bush administration and its lawyers tried so hard to make their war crimes somehow not war crimes. Here are some examples. The Bush administration declared that the Geneva Conventions were inapplicable. It asserted that because those detained were not in uniform, this alone meant they were somehow not covered by the Third Geneva Convention. But the document confers no such immunity from coverage. Article 3 states that all those no longer taking an active part in hostilities, including those captured or surrendered in war, are initially protected. Whether or not they are wearing uniforms is irrelevant. Next, the Bush administration claimed an exemption because terrorists, both individually and collectively, have not ratified the Geneva Conventions and thus cannot claim protection. However, there is no reciprocity requirement. According to Article 2, all signatories to the conventions are unilaterally bound by the provisions. Again, it's legally irrelevant. Finally, Bush's lawyers argued that Article 5 of the 4th Geneva Convention had a loophole, namely that provisions were inapplicable while the armed conflict continues. However, the conventions state that the exception is only intended to be applied in individual cases of an exceptional nature. Instead, the U.S. military, under the direction of the Bush administration, indiscriminately rounded up thousands in Afghanistan and later Iraq. Some were not even screened for months. On September 6, 2006, Bush asked Congress to amend the War Crimes Act of 1996 in order to decriminalize their actions retroactively. Among the war crimes that he thereby implicitly admitted authorizing in the past were disappearances, extrajudicial imprisonment, torture, transporting prisoners between countries, and denying the International Committee of the Red Cross access to prisoners. On the very same day, Bush ordered that 14 people detained in secret prisons be flown to Guantanamo for trial. He thereby admitted that he had been supporting American gulags overseas. Furthermore, one could argue that the entirety of the Iraq War constituted a war crime due to the illegality of the conflict in general. The United Nations Charter, which legally binds all nations, prohibits the use of armed force except in very limited conditions of self-defense, which were in this case inapplicable. Without UN Security Council authorization, a good argument could be made that the US invasion of Iraq was itself unlawful. So, how did the US legal system respond to the war crimes and human rights abuses? Mostly with pronouncements, but no action. In 2004, in Rasul v. Bush and Hamdi v. Rumsfeld, the court ruled that those held in a U.S. prison, including Guantanamo, had the right to contest their detentions by filing a writ of habeas corpus. In 2006, the Supreme Court ruled in Hamden v. Rumsfeld that Donald Rumsfeld, then Secretary of Defense, had violated Article 3 of all four Geneva Conventions of 1949. The offense was refusing to allow a prisoner under the custody of the U.S. military to be tried in a regularly constituted court. By doing this, the justices, by implication, identified George W. Bush, the author of the executive order of November 13, 2001, which established the unconstitutional court, as himself a war criminal. But here's the thing. Neither Bush nor Rumsfeld was on trial in either case, since the role of the Supreme Court was, as usual, to clarify principles to be applied at the trial court level. Also, nearly every other war crime was broadly ignored, and no such trials have ever taken place. In June 2008, Congressman Dennis Kucinich of Ohio introduced a comprehensive House resolution to impeach George W. Bush. It went nowhere. Formerly accusing the president of war crimes never gains much traction. Michael Haas, a political scientist and author of the most comprehensive book on the subject of Bush's war crimes, once wrote, Hundreds of years of human rights progress are in serious jeopardy as long as governmental war criminals live blissfully in the knowledge that they will never be accountable for their crimes. Insofar as decision makers feel free to violate well established norms of proper conduct, terrorists have been emboldened and have easily attracted volunteers. The surreal symbiosis between war criminals in Washington and terrorists around the world makes everyone less secure. With that in mind, where are these war criminals? 
Near the end of his tenure as vice president, Dick Cheney was awarded an honorary doctorate of public service by Brigham Young University, where he delivered the commencement address. Following his term as VP, he became an author, political commentator, and regularly hosts fundraisers for the Republican Party. He had a heart transplant in 2012, and at age 78, lives a fairly comfortable life of wealth and continued influence. Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense and overseer of prisoner abuse, faced no serious consequences. In 2011, he released a memoir to rehabilitate his image, and in the same year was awarded the Defender of the Constitution Award at CPAC in Washington, D.C. Former President George W. Bush paints jokes. As of late, the painfully predictable reaction from the right and from coddling liberals has been defending the actions of George W. Bush by invoking Barack Obama. If Bush is a war criminal, then you have to call Obama a war criminal, they sarcastically and smugly exclaim. They are so close to the point, and they never seem to realize it. They draw right up to the border of an epiphany about U.S. imperialism that exists and is propagated irrespective of administration, and then race away from the epiphany as fast as their legs can carry them. Aha, you thought this was a video about trashing a Republican president and a moderately funny but very successful comedian, but is actually about U.S. hegemony on the world stage and war crimes in general. But seriously, the Obama administration is responsible for broadening the so-called War on Terror, not ending it as he once claimed, and the civilian deaths under his watchful eye were staggering. The difference between the foreign policies of Bush and Obama are a matter of scale, and a schoolyard argument of who started it. Bush was definitely a worse president than Obama, but this is only a matter of degrees. Now, the reason it's more socially acceptable and forgivable for a celebrity to hang out with Obama is because we are willing to accept a little ignorance among the citizenry that might not know much about our current wars. Attacks on Obama from the right during his presidency were full of lies. Lies about the aims of his health care plan, lies about his religion. If the right ever criticized his wars, it was only that he didn't go far enough. His own party had no incentive to criticize their president on the wars either. That means that if neither major party is criticizing imperialism, then it's not news. If it's not news, it's not well known. It's believable that Obama's celebrity friends don't know about his expansion of war authority under the AUMF. That doesn't make it right, but it does make it understandable since he's not really known for that. It's not, however, believable that Bush's celebrity friends just don't know what he was up to during his administration, because the AUMF was brand new, the war on terror was brand new, the wars were all we talked about during his administration, not because people were outraged. The Democratic candidate who opposed him in 2004, John Kerry, didn't want to call off the wars, he only campaigned on being better at war. It was all we talked about because it was all still new, which meant it was all still profitable for news organizations to have stories about it every night, and it had the byproduct of informing the electorate. It's not as profitable to talk about Niger and Yemen in 2019. News organizations prioritize profitable topics. Climate change, for example, is arguably the most serious crisis facing humanity, but it's not the number one topic in news. Not even close. This is because climate change news is ratings poison. Chris Hayes of MSNBC recently stated that climate change doesn't pull ratings, and that's why it's not a bigger story. If it's not a bigger story, people don't think it's urgent, even though it is. If viewers don't care about civilian deaths across seven countries, then it won't be reported on, which means there is no opportunity to care, which then means that politicians don't have to campaign for or against it anymore. Ellen DeGeneres, yeah, remember her, definitely knows what Bush was doing during his administration because it was all over the news at the time. It was all we talked about. DeGeneres made a speech following the backlash about the importance of being kind. Two problems. First, rehabilitating Bush has consequences that go beyond someone's anecdotal experiences with him at a ball game. And second, being kind to everyone is impossible because being kind to some people is inherently unkind to others. Being kind to a war criminal is being unkind to his victims, to the families of his victims. Being friends with an oppressor is cruel to the oppressed. Making excuses for the oppressor is cruel to the oppressed.
not to mention the consequences to the future that this could have by taking part in this rehabilitation. Once more for the people in the back, this is not about you personally having friends and family who registered to vote under a different party. Your friend or sibling who votes differently from yourself probably did not order bombs dropped on children. Bush did. Nobody is saying you can't be friends with someone whose party registration is different. That's a private matter, whereas this is very much happening in public, including, but not limited, to doubling down on national television and trying to block criticism of this online. Bush's celebrity friends are far too rich to be materially affected by his policies and continued legacy. This is common among the economic elites. Once you become rich, solidarity among the wealthy often becomes more important than any other concerns. It is a kinship that goes beyond race, sexual orientation, or politics. How soon following the Trump administration will he be rehabilitated by the media and his powerful friends? Unthinkable? So was the rehabilitation of Bush only 10 years ago. The rich are unconcerned, reducing indefensible actions to differences of opinion. In fact, some are economically invested in these rehabilitations, regardless of consequences. It's why Sean Spicer was compared with Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels while he served Trump, but is now dancing with the stars. Those with power and influence have whitewashed Bush's history and have laid the groundwork for history to repeat itself. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. <laughs> they never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we.